Don't forget our great EV giveaway. Subscribe and enter for the chance to win one of several electrifying prizes, including one of four electric cars. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Fully Charged News Show. I'm going to really go for dense data, not opinionated ranting waffle. So that should please some viewers, although I do despise brand new SUVs with combustion engines. Sorry. So I didn't get very far with that, damn it. Sorry. Anyway, obviously, the big story in recent days has been the launch of the Ford F-150 Lightning, the 100% electric pickup truck President Biden took out for a spin just before the launch. Now, I'm not going to pontificate about most people who drive huge pickup trucks in America, very much like the people who drive thumping great SUVs in this country. About 80% of those cars are registered at urban addresses and, and they're not used off-road. They never tow a trailer and they generally spend their time parking, blocking up streets because they're parked on the side of them or they're static in massive traffic jams with their engines running. But it, it's a fact. Combustion engine pickups are very, very popular in the USA. And I'm going to ignore all the downsides about the size and weight and say it's a great thing that Ford are making an electric pickup truck. I hope they sell shed loads of them. And I'm sure we'll feature a test drive on the F-150 Lightning very soon. They have introduced a couple of things that all electric vehicles should have. Yes, they've got a massive frunk. And that's sensible, and it just shows what a stupid waste of space a big combustion engine and transmission are. Secondly, they can send power out of the vehicle to run anything, including your home. Well, this is not new. I mean, the Nissan Leaf has been capable of this since 2012. And that's just to name one car. The Sonos Scion can do it now. Uh, the, the new Hyundai Ioniq 5 can do it. But it is new to millions of people who might not have heard of any of this stuff before, and those sort of people might buy a Ford pickup truck. And of course, it's powerful. According to the voiceover, the lightning goes like a bullet train, but it hauls like a freight train. Excellent. All that aside, I'm going to let someone else say their piece about this car. Someone who currently drives a combustion engine F-150, so knows what they're talking about because I really think they nailed it. Now, I'm going to have to speak their words as I can't be bothered going through some painful, agonizing YouTube copyright shenanigans and getting taken down and sued and all that stuff if we include the original clip here. Rachel Maddow is the host of The Rachel Maddow Show, which is broadcast nightly on MSNBC. She loves cars and she drives an F-150 pickup now. Some people love her, some people absolutely hate her. And I'm not the slightest bit bothered. I like her because she's obviously someone who talks even more than I do. She could talk under wet cement, as my loving wife would say. But she was uh, spot on when covering the launch of the Ford F-150 Lightning. She said this, and I am quoting. Here's the thing. Whether or not you care about pickup trucks, whether or not you care about cars, whether or not you care about electric cars, even whether or not climate change and energy are things that keep you awake at night. If the Ford F-150 becomes an electric vehicle, because as an electric vehicle it's better, goodbye gas cars in America. There isn't a single thing that can be done in this country to move us further and faster towards a no-gas automotive future and everything that means for infrastructure and climate than this one vehicle. Well said, Rachel. Yeah, it's a huge pickup truck. If you work on a building site and haul stuff around, if you tow big trailers and drive up to your cabin in the woods, this is obviously a great truck. It's huge, very American, and I think it's great. If in 12 months time, in the glorious US of A, you can choose between a Tesla Cybertruck, a Rivian R1 or a Ford F-150, and they're all pure electric, and they become popular and normal across the broad spectrum of people who drive pickups in America, and as Rachel Maddow said, that is gazillions of people, then this is definitely a gateway car. And if they get it near the suggested starting price of $40,000, 
I'll be very, very impressed. And now, courtesy of Electric, <laughs> uh, who brought this to my attention, an electric vehicle from the extreme opposite end of the electric vehicle spectrum. The Lingstar M15 is a two-seater electric car that looks a bit like it was made from some plastic buckets and a swimming pool handrail. But you can buy it now on the road from Alibaba for $10,000 or around £7,000 or €8,200. It only goes 34 miles an hour or about 55 kph. It has a claimed range of 150 kilometers or 90 miles on a charge. But that is going to take you quite a while at 55 kph. But imagine, you're not going to be driving this across the highways or going up into the mountains. Imagine driving one of these in a busy city. You've got lockable storage in the back. You steer it with handlebars. It looks totally weird, but I bet it's great fun to drive. And it will be comically fuel efficient. I can't find out the battery capacity, but it's going to be small. And I would say this is going to cost well below one pence or one cent a kilometre or a mile in fuel. Because it's just going to be almost free. OK, a couple of stories from Australia, courtesy of the ABC. The first one is a perfect example of the disruption caused by the energy transition. Nothing is going to be smooth, but it is all possible. Being married to an Australian and having spent a lot of time there over the last 30 years, I can state without hesitation that the uptake of domestic solar in Australia is high, very high. And in some places, it's having a very disruptive impact. In the southern suburbs of Adelaide, for example, there is so much rooftop solar installed that on cool sunny days, there is far more solar generation than the whole South Australian grid can use. Not just the city, the entire South Australia. Just to explain, on hot sunny days, the energy needed to run all the air conditioning in houses is more than enough to suck up all the solar power on offer. But in Australia, it can also be very sunny when the temperature is not so hot. Hence the need for vast amounts of electricity storage. And there is some quite chunky stuff in South Australia. The big 129 megawatt hour Tesla grid battery at the Hornsdale wind farm. But that is not enough. And the grid operators are having to control how much electricity people can pump into the network at any one time. It's very understandable. So they are instigating a system called flexible exports, which means there will be periods where the owners of solar panels have the power they supply to the grid strictly limited. And at other times, they can send out as much as they can produce if they want to. And we're going to be doing a podcast about this very topic in the near future. I suspect this is the start of similar schemes around the world as solar becomes more and more ubiquitous. And the flip side of that story is this one from October last year. I love this. For one hour, just one hour, on Sunday the 11th of October 2020, the entire state of South Australia was powered by solar generation alone. That's 1.7 million people. Their homes, shops, cafes, restaurants, hospitals, factories, all powered 100% by solar. And it's important to remember that they weren't in a lockdown at this time, not like the rest of the world, more or less. Uh, Australia has been very good at keeping the uh, pandemic at bay. It's a bit of a first, but that gives you some idea of the scale of solar and the potential it has in Australia and the rest of the world. And while I'm referring to that beautiful country, I just can't help mentioning the fact that we're holding fully charged live in Sydney, Australia on the 29th and 30th of October 2022. So a long way off. But if you live in Australia, you might want to jot it down in your diary. Next story. Now, I have mentioned on previous episodes the rather sad tale of Toyota's very slow decision to start making battery electric cars. Honda have been a bit slow, but at least they're now, they've now got the excellent Honda E out and they're selling them. I've seen quite a few of them around in the UK. We know that Toyota are bringing out some 100% battery electric cars for the global market soon. And they've been making electric cars in China for a long time. But they have been very focused, as we're all aware, on hydrogen fuel cell cars. However, Subaru, and I think that's the first time I've even mentioned that brand name on Fully Charged, uh, they joined Toyota, the Toyota Group, last year, and they have just announced that in 2022, the Subaru Solterra 
100% electric car will be available in the US of A. And their press release states that the car will combine Subaru's expertise in all-wheel drive technology, which we all know about and is amazing, and Toyota's vehicle electrification technology. So some good news finally coming out of Japan, a country which, by the way, is buying many hundreds of small and medium-sized wind turbines that are made in the UK. Now, a company we've covered in the past, Britwind, is sending out shiploads of them. And they're very popular with Japanese farmers. And this isn't like 10 or 50, this is hundreds of them. I'm just saying this as we'll hopefully be covering uh, more about this homegrown success story later this year. Next story. Now, we hear again and again about the impact of mining, transporting, and processing the materials needed to make an electric car. It's a huge issue and one that always needs addressing. And most importantly, understanding all the implications therein. But just for balance, here's a story from the D Smog blog about the side effects from fracking. No, not earthquakes, something potentially much worse and much more long term. Uh, the D Smog blog asked the simple question where does all the radioactive fracking waste go? Wait, what? The, no one told me the millions of gallons of waste fracking liquids that have to be dealt with uh, to allow this extreme and desperate form of fossil extraction to take place are radioactive. Are you kidding? I mean, you've got to store it. You have to trust that private companies with shareholders are going to store and protect this radioactive waste for decades, even centuries. I mean, just listen to this. On May the 8th, 2017, a drum of radioactive waste from Australia arrived at a remote West Texas storage facility. Wait, what? Radioactive waste from Australia? But they don't have any nuclear power plants. Why would they want to transport nuclear waste to America? Well, it's radioactive waste water from fracking activities used to extract natural gas in Australia. Okay, fair enough. But this drum was transported to Texas from Australia on a Singapore Airlines jet. It was a cargo jet. It wasn't full of people. But still, I mean, it's a bit extreme. According to files from the Railroad Commission of Texas, the state's main oil and gas regulator, it contained the radioactive element radium at concentrations of 2,095 picocuries per gram. Yeah, I don't know what that means either. I, I, don't worry about it. It's just, look, it's just 400 times higher than the safe limits designated by the US Environmental Protection Agency. Oh, but ignore that. What about lithium mines? I hear the fossil Ramonas wail on and on and on about. What about the lithium mines? There aren't many lithium mines, but never mind, forget it. And most of the lithium comes from Australia. Australia's big in this episode. I didn't plan it that way. It's just the way it turned out. But wait a minute. The oil and gas industry has been really good at painting the picture that they are not a radioactive industry. I didn't know. I know I'll get comments from people saying they did know. But I'm obviously thick. I didn't know. The story in the smog blog, I don't know how you say it, the de-smog blog, is about the radioactive waste storage facility in Texas that's literally overflowing with hazardous radioactive material. Not from nuclear power plants, but from the madcap and now bankrupt dash to frack. Okay, so the point I want to make is that the side effects of the oil and gas industry are rigorously ignored and carefully obfuscated all the time for very, very good reasons. We are leaving a legacy of long-term dangerous filth for our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren to deal with and clean up. And when I say we, I absolutely include myself, every human being that has benefited in any way from the use of fossil fuels is, is completely bound up in this. We can, we can use, this is the difference, this is the big important point, we can use the materials in an electric car and battery again and again. We can recycle those materials. Show me one litre of recycled diesel and I'll rename fully charged, fully dieseled up. Or something equally rubbish. Next story. Now, remember I said at the start that I wasn't going to clog up this episode with opinionated ranting and waffle. Clearly, I lied. Well, 
sort of, because here's another fossil extraction story I cannot ignore. This one is from Canada. Sorry, did someone say tar sands? Did, tar sands? Tar sands, anyone? <laughs> the totally benign method of extracting oil that's totally fine, according to the Canadian government. Don't worry about it. Do not worry about it. It's fine. No, this isn't about tar sands. Tar sands, which is without question the dirtiest and most energy intensive and super short-sighted idiocy on the planet. Thank you, Canada. God. No, no, let's ignore that. This is lovely Canadian Natural Resources Limited. What a lovely company they must be. They, might, they probably make soap or something like that, or bamboo towels. Yeah, they're a company who've reported an average annual profit of 1.9 billion over the last decade. Yeah, they are an oil company, fair enough, and they're receiving over $100 million of taxpayers' money to clean up their defunct, toxic, busted, flush oil wells. Not, not tar sands. I mean, that's going to cost trillions to clean that up. Well, it'll never be cleaned up if they've just destroyed that part of the planet's surface. But no, this is just your standard old nodding donkey oil wells. They, see, they make money selling us the oil, then they make some money getting us to pay for cleaning up the devastation they leave in their wake. That is a really great business plan. Next story. MG Cars. Well, we've reviewed the MG ZSE and the MG5 estate, and now MG, who were originally known for their sports cars, are developing a sports car. Actually, not just developing, they're going into production ready for a 2022 release of this car. Now, it looks silly and like so many concept cars I've seen at car shows over the years. According to the parent company, it has got the go-ahead and they will start production for a convertible open-top MG sports car that looks pretty different to the ones that I knew when I was a kid. Although, no doubt, there will be numerous changes to the design. Well, that's it. Minimal end waffles, only to list a few of the amazing people who support this channel via Patreon from $10 a month or more. Wonderful people, thank you so much for your support. They are Marcus Cornmel, Michael Toman, Richard Hadzuk, John Dunlop, Phil Tordoff, Sean Walsh, Shannon Farrell, Jose Arelaga, Mark Hutchinson, David Howard, Brian Smith, Steve Jordan, Edwin Cortine, Steve Savory, Michael Rabinsky, Susan Graves, Niels Bolt Wilson, Dibbs, Gavin, John McConville, and Ray Adams. Thank you so much for your support. It really, really is vitally important to keep this show going. That's, what, that's why we're here. Thank you so much. That's it. As always, if you have been, thank you for watching.